Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our last COVID-19 webinar. My name is Kanyisida Khwadi, and I'm going to be your moderator for today's uh, talks. Uh, these uh, webinars have been uh, hosted by the South African Immunology Society and Immunopedia, and they have been generally, generously sponsored by Inglaba Biotech. Uh, today, we are going to have three talks, which are going to be centered around the cytochrome storm during COVID-19 with focus on children. And then could you please uh, use the question and answer panel to ask any questions, to share any experiences or any challenges during the webinar. So our first speaker today, it's gonna be Professor Teresa Russell. She is a professor in the Department of Immunology at the University of Pretoria. She is a clinician scientist and she holds a double PhD, one in immunology and the other in philosophy. She is an NRF rated scientist uh, who works mainly in the field of HIV and related infections and her specific interests are in HIV associated uh, drug resistance and also systemic uh, immune activation. She is also a member of uh, several scientific committees that include the, uh, the World Health Organization Innovation and Working Group and also the HIV ResNet and also the Southern African HIV Clinicians Society. Currently, she is involved in work that is assessing the difference in clinical and immunological profiles of HIV infected and HIV uninfected patients that have been hospitalized with COVID-19. So now I'm going to hand over to our first speaker, Prof. Teresa Rousseau. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Kanisili, for that lovely introduction. Let me just start sharing my slides. There we go. So, good day, everybody. It is really a pleasure for me to talk to you about immunological pathways leading to a COVID-19 cytokine storm. And when I started preparing this talk, I thought it was pretty straightforward. Um, but there have been events in the last two, three weeks that have really turned everything upside down. So it turned out to be rather much more complicated than I first imagined. But I will try to give you a succinct update of where I think we are at the moment. Here we go. So we will briefly discuss what a cytokine storm is. Is there a cytokine storm in COVID-19? What are the underlying pathways and how it can be treated? So a cytokine storm actually has no definition and no firm biological diagnosis. But broadly speaking, it's a hyperactive immune response um, characterized by release of interferons, interleukins, tumor necrosis factor, chemokines, and other mediators. And these mediators are part of a well-conserved innate immune response that is important for clearing and effectively getting rid of infection. The concept of a cytokine storm implies that the level of cytokine release is harmful to the host, but it has been very difficult to distinguish an appropriate from a dysregulated inflammatory response to date, and it remains a major challenge in the field. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with the terms, let me just briefly recap. So cytokines are cell messengers, and as I said, these include interferons, tumor necrosis factor, and interleukins. And they are a category of signaling molecules that mediate and regulate immunity, inflammation, and hematopoiesis. Chemokines are a special kind of chemoattractant cytokine that direct the migration of white blood cells to infected or damaged tissue. But it's quite a complicated business. There are more than 240 molecules that have already been identified. And to complicate it even further, many cells can secrete the same cytokine. One cytokine can have many different functions. There's overlapping function with other cytokines. And there is also a combined effect that is more than just the additive effect. So we see synergy with these cytokines. Also, and I think it's important to remember, especially in COVID, that even though levels may be elevated, and may be associated with the level of treatment response or even with the severity of disease, they do not necessarily imply pathogenesis. So one should be very careful to make treatment decisions based on single mediators tested at variable time points. 
So studying cytokines is a bit like looking at big data, where there's a lot of disconnected information that's coming at you all the time. And if you don't ask the right question, you will discover nothing. A cytokine storm is also sometimes referred to as cytokine release syndrome, which is an acute systemic inflammatory syndrome characterized by fever and multi-organ dysfunction. And it was first described after chimeric antigen receptor or CAR T cell therapy for malignancies, which was effectively treated with the interleukin-6 receptor blockade in the form of tocilizumab. It has subsequently also been described with the use of therapeutic antibodies, and I think most of you will recall the severe CRS that occurred in healthy volunteers after treatment with a CD28 super agonist. Now, importantly, the source of the cytokine release is believed to be from monocyte-derived cells and sometimes from endothelial cells and not the T cells. And that is why blocking IL-6 does not impede the therapeutic effect of CAR T cells. So CRS is triggered by release of interferon gamma by activated T cells or tumor cells. And interferon gamma activates macrophages, which produce excessive IL-6, TNF-alpha, and IL-10. And what makes IL-6 so important is that it binds to the IL-6 receptor, and this complex then binds to GP1 and activates cell types that ordinarily do not express IL-6 receptor. So IL-6 causes off-target effects as well, like vascular leakage, activation of the component and coagulation cascades, disseminated intravascular coagulation or DIC, and cardiomyopathy. And other cytokines such as interferon gamma and tumor and necrosis factor alpha cause flu-like symptoms. And TNF-alpha also causes vascular leakage, cardiomyopathy, lung injury, and production of acute phase proteins. It's also important to remember that different cytokines and immune effector molecules play a role at different time points. And the inflammatory picture will therefore depend on the day on which the tests have been done. So another term that's often used interchangeably with cytokine storm is cytosis, or HLH, or macrophage activation syndrome, or MAS. So secondary HLH is triggered by infections, malignancy, and autoimmune diseases, while MAS is a form of secondary HLH associated specifically with autoimmune disease. Now, both CRS and HLH demonstrate activation of macrophages and the reticular endothelial system, which is initi initiated by T-cell-mediated inflammation. And indeed, most patients with moderate to severe CRS have laboratory features that meet some of the criteria for HLH. Although patients with CRS may or may not have hepatosplenomegaly or evidence of hemophagocytosis, which as you can see from these criteria for HLH are prominent features of this diagnosis. And I think it's very important that we keep these entities distinct since they are causing a lot of confusion in the COVID literature. So at the moment, a cytokine storm is a blanket term that's used to describe many distinct but overlapping inflammatory syndromes, including CRS, HLH, MAS, sepsis, and even a bit of ARDS. So one of the big questions at the moment is whether there is a cytokine storm in COVID. And if there is, is it CRS or HLH or actually something different? And as you can see, there are many different opinions. So many papers describe a cytokine storm, and this has also made its way into the popular media. But two recent studies disputed that a cytokine storm exists. On the other hand, some have argued that HLH lies at the bottom of the immunopathology of COVID, but others have disputed this. So what is going on? Now we know from previous epidemics, from avian flu and other coronaviruses such as SARS-CoV-1 and MERS, that cases of cytokine storm were described. They reported elevated levels of cytokines such as interferon gamma and alpha, IL-6, and the chemokines such as CXCL10, together with very high levels of ferritin, D-dimer, hepatic dysfunction, 
a thrombotic tendency and the development of DRC. So what are we seeing in COVID? Now the first studies described an increase in 17 cytokines when healthy controls were compared with hospitalized patients with different patterns observed when comparing healthy controls with ICU patients and when comparing hospitalized patients with ICU patients. Now, the most striking differences were observed in CXCL10, also known as IP10, CCL2, also known as MCP1, and TNF-alpha. It's known that these cytokines and chemokines are markers of an activated innate immune system response and that they participate in the development of ARDS. In contrast to SARS-CoV-1 patients, however, COVID patients also had higher levels of two helper two cell secreted cytokines, such as IL-10, which inhibit the inflammatory response. And this may be responsible for a greater number of secondary infections described in non-survivors in COVID. Some of the earlier studies reported a marked increase in 14 cytokines in patients with COVID compared with healthy controls and continuously high levels of three of these cytokines, namely CXCL10, TCL7, and IL-1 receptor antagonist were associated with increased viral load, loss of lung function, and lung injury. And in this study of 27 patients sampled at four time points over 14 days, 41 markers were elevated, and those with a fatal outcome had high levels of CCL2, CCL7, IL-8, MIG, and IL-6. Note that all but one of these are chemokines, and that most of these markers only became significant after day 10. So the question is, of course, if these markers come up late, do they have any prognostic value? And in this meta-analysis of almost 6,500 patients, the marker with the best performance in terms of sensitivity and specificity was the neutrophil count at a cutoff value of more than 3.74. Patients with high CRP, D-dimer, neutrophils, and IL-6 had the highest likelihood of mortality, but IL-6 was definitely not the best predictor. So it does seem as if some patients do develop a kind of cytokine storm, but how common is it? So in COVID, it's been reported that ARDS develops in about one in five to maybe one in 10 patients, and that a systemic dysregulated immune response occurs in about 5% of patients with severe disease. So we are really talking about the minority of patients who develop a kind of cytokine storm. And how does it happen? Well, it all starts with a spike protein of SARS-CoV-2, which binds to ACE2 receptors and leads to the downregulation of ACE2, which in turn results in excessive production of angiotensin II, which acts as a pro-inflammatory cytokine and further activates NF-kappa B and ADAM17, which stimulate the production of TNF-alpha. ACE2 receptors are highly expressed on the surface of alveolar epithelial type 2 cells, cardiac, renal, intestinal, and endothelial cells. And this coincides with the disease pathology that we see in COVID. But in vitro and animal studies of MERS and SARS demonstrated that they also infect T cells, macrophages, and dendritic cells. And since these cells have minimal ACE2 receptor expression, it is likely that there's another yet unknown mechanism of infection. The infection of macrophages and dendritic cells is crucial, since even though this leads to an abortive infection, in other words, the virus enters the cell but cannot successfully complete replication, it induces the secretion of pro-inflammatory chemokines by dendritic cells and macrophages. In addition, this infection of primary myelo-derived dendritic cells causes an impaired defensive interferon response which is paralleled by modest upregulation of pro-inflammatory cytokines, such as TNF-alpha and IL-6, and a much more significant upregulation of inflammatory chemokines, such as CXCL10. So it seems that SARS-CoV-2 has developed various strategies to evade and counteract the antiviral interferon response. 
And this seems to me to be at the heart of the matter. When the interferon response is too little and too late, it results in a delayed but increased release of cytokines and chemokines that are characteristic of a T-helper-1 response, causing an excessive infiltration of neutrophils and inflammatory macrophages into lung tissue with consequent lung damage. So all these cytokines work together to create a soup of inflammation, which elicit a train of events which culminate in disease in almost all organ systems. So what do we see on the blood picture? So COVID-19 patients have an exaggerated release of acute phase reagents like CRP, serum amyloid A, and ferritin, which is in line with rapid activation of the innate immune system. T cells are much lower than expected, and this is most likely secondary to direct infection and increased apoptosis of these cells. And this hypothesis is supported by transcriptomic analysis which has demonstrated upregulation of genes involved in apoptosis and the P53 pathways. While some groups have reported that CD8 cells are functionally exhausted and incapable of generating interferon and TNF, these cells have generally been shown to be highly activated and to be enriched with cytolytic enzymes such as perforin and granulysin, which add to lung injury. Severe cases have a high neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio, and some studies have shown that there's an 8% increased risk of mortality for each unit increase in the NLR. The lymphocyte to CRP ratios are also useful and are significantly decreased in serious COVID-2 patients. IL-1 and tumor necrosis factor alpha both increase T alpha 17 responses and vascular permeability and leakage. Now, T helper 17 is very important because it exerts a pro-inflammatory action by promoting the production of inflammatory cytokines and chemokines that are capable of recruiting more immune cells and matrix metalloproteinases that contribute to tissue injury and remodeling. Increased T helper 17 responses were also described in MERS and SARS-1. And in these diseases, patients with greater IL-17 and lower interferon had a worse prognosis. So the simplistic hypothesis is that in severe COVID, there's a pro-inflammatory cascade, the T-helper-1 and 17 cytokine upregulation, leading to increased vascular permeability and leakage with severe lung damage. In mild COVID, there is a sufficient anti-inflammatory response to control the T-helper-1 drive. This may also be the reason why children and pregnant women generally have a mild disease. Now, these patients are known to have an immune response that is skewed towards the T-helper-2 profile with specific generation of related cytokines like IL-4 and IL-10, which could be counteracting the pro-inflammatory response to COVID. And we will hear more about the disease profile seen in children in the next two talks. This may also be the reason that the elderly is at risk of such severe disease. On the one hand, the elderly have immunosenescence, which is characterized by low levels of functional T cell subset, inversion of the typical CD8 cell ratio due to the loss of CD8 T cells, an increase in Treg, and a decrease in B cells and antibodies, which culminate in an impaired ability to respond to new infections. But on the other hand, the elderly have an increase in innate immune responses and chronic inflammation, a phenomenon that's called inflamed aging, and this increases their likelihood to develop tissue damage. So besides the low numbers of peripheral lymphocytes, there's striking atrophy of the secondary lymphoid organs, including the lymph nodes and spleen, confirmed by autopsy findings. There's evidence of necrosis, cell degeneration, and increased macrophage apoptosis in the spleen. There are also decreased number of T cells and increased macrophages. And it should be noted that destruction of lymphoid tissues and organs is very unusual in CRS and sepsis, where one is more likely to see lymphadenopathy and splenomegaly. 
It has been proposed that there's a dynamic interaction between four vicious feedback loops that these authors call the four horsemen of the apocalypse. These are the viral loop, the hyperinflammatory loop, the non-canonical renin and utensin system axis loop, and the hypercoagulation loop. I think the coagulation loop is especially important, but I don't have time to discuss it in detail today. Suffice to say that inflammation activates coagulation and coagulation increases inflammation and that platelets play an important role in both processes. So what are we seeing in clinical practice? The first question is, are we seeing HLH? So this study of 40 COVID patients in ICU showed that despite evidence of hyperinflammation with high fevers, CRP levels more than 300 in most, and ferritin more than 10,000 in about a fifth of patients, only 7.5% achieved a diagnostic H score of more than 169. And this low score was due to the absence of hepatosplenomegaly and neutropenia. It would seem that a different set of criteria would be needed to diagnose HLH associated with COVID, especially since it has been proposed that there's a different mechanism of macrophage activation in COVID, which could possibly be direct activation by the virus without the need for lymphocytes. The second question is whether we are really seeing a cytokine storm in COVID. So this table summarizes reported IL-6 levels in five cohorts of patients with COVID and three with ARDS. You can see that the median IL-6 levels in patients with a hyperinflammatory phenotype of ARDS are 10 to 200 fold higher than levels in patients with severe COVID-19. And interestingly enough, in CRS, peak plasma levels of IL-6 are almost a thousand fold higher than that reported in severe COVID. So the hypothesis put forward by these authors is that severe viral pneumonia from COVID primarily produces lung and vascular injury without the same magnitude of systemic responses as with CRS. For example, a post-mortem study of COVID patients with ARDS reported that alveolar microthrombi were nine times more prevalent than in patients with influenza ARDS. In fact, the authors of this paper referred to the cytokine storm in COVID as nothing more than a tempest in a teapot. But before we discount the presence of a cytokine storm, we should consider that there are significant limitations to the observations in this study. Almost all of the COVID data were from clinical laboratory tests, while the ARDS studies used ELISA for IL-6 measurement. And it's well known that there are calibration issues and significant interlock variability with ELISA agents. However, these Dutch researchers also dispute the occurrence of a cytokine storm. They compared 46 patients with COVID with ARDS, with patients with septic shock with and without ARDS, out of hospital cardiac arrest and multiple trauma. Levels of TNF, IL-6 and IL-8 were significantly lower in patients with COVID than in patients with septic shock with or without ARDS. A major limitation of this study, however, is that COVID patients were compared with patient data that had been collected over the past 10 years, casting doubt on the appropriateness of that control group. So in the last larger study to date, also published in the last three weeks, researchers followed almost one and a half thousand patients hospitalized for COVID from the day of hospitalization to the day of discharge or death. They found that serum IL-6, 8, and TNF-alpha at the time of hospitalization were strong and independent predictors of patient survival. And after adjusting for confounders and comorbidities, IL-6 and TNF-alpha serum levels remained independent and significant predictors of disease severity and death. Importantly, their comparison group was nine healthy controls and 151 patients with cancer who either developed or did not develop CRS after CAR T cell therapy, tested on the same platform. The vast majority of patients presented with elevated cytokines 
equivalent to those observed with CRS after CAR T cell therapy. Interestingly, IL-6 was one of the most robust prognostic markers of survival, outperforming CRP, D-dimer, and ferritin after adjusting for demographic factors and comorbidities. Elevated TNF-alpha, known to contribute to organ damage, was also a strong predictor of poor outcome, even after adjusting for other risk factors, including IL-6. There's currently a big debate about whether IL-6 or TNF-alpha would be the best marker and aim of treatment strategies, but we unfortunately don't have time to explore that today. So to wrap up, clinicians should be on high alert for the possibility of a cytokine storm. However, given that there appears to be different kinds of storms and often only a storm in a teacup, the diagnosis is challenging and the development of a specific diagnostic test is a high priority. We also urgently need diagnostic criteria. The following criteria have been suggested. A sudden or rapid progression with multiple organ involvement, a significant decline in peripheral blood lymphocyte counts, significant elevation of systemic inflammatory indicators, especially CRP, serum ferritin, and ESR, and the elevation of multiple cytokines. And of these, I would prioritize IL-6, TNF-alpha, and IP-10. So understanding the underlying immunological pathways are critical for appropriate management of patients. Various options exist. One can supplement with interferon early to activate innate immunity. One can use immunomodulators such as steroids and immunoglobulins. Barrier. But it's really important to first understand the immunopathology before we can know which strategy will be the best. So, in conclusion, there does appear to be a unique form or more likely various forms of a cytokine storm in a minority of severely ill COVID patients. But COVID-19 is still best viewed as an inflammatory endotheliolitis with direct viral infection of pneumocytes, endothelial and epithelial cells producing inflammatory cytokines and immune-mediated damage to the vasculature and surrounding tissue. And a comprehensive management approach is called for. Thank you for your attention. I hope the talk has not made you feel like this, but rather like this. I'm now happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Prof. Rousseau, uh, for the lovely presentation. And I'm just gonna check on the question and answer. Uh, so we have a first question from Dee. And the question is, what is, the most, what is one most likely to see in treated and untreated HIV patients? Um, I guess the question is about COVID. What we are seeing. Um, it's about COVID. Yeah, so at the moment, we're actually not seeing many HIV patients with COVID. Um, initially, we were very concerned that um, our HIV patients will be at severe risk of COVID and also severe complications of COVID. But we really have not seen this. Um, and we haven't seen a difference in patients who are treated or not treated with ARVs. So one of the hypotheses that we are looking at is whether, um, because we know HIV-infected patients have very high levels of anti-inflammatory cytokines, like TGF-beta-1, um, whether that is in a way protecting them um, from a severe inflammatory response to COVID. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Prof. Um, uh, attendees, uh, you're welcome to ask uh, live questions in the Q&A panel. Uh, we still have some time with Prof. Russell. And I have one question I wanted to ask. I mean, regarding the cytokine storm, even though at the moment uh, we don't have, there's no, uh, the territory is not in agreement with the actual definition of this cytokine storm. Are all the patients that are being uh, admitted to hospital with severe COVID-19, do they all get tested for 
the cytokine storm? Is it standard practice? Finicili, that's such a good question. So at the moment, we don't have IL-6 um, testing available as a diagnostic test or any of the cytokines for that matter. So it's only a research tool at present. I know there are some um, places that are looking at instituting a platform um, and the difficulty with understanding the literature at the moment is that different platforms will have different cuttle values for IL-6. Um, and we really see a lot of variability between kits. Even if we use our own platform, um, but different IL-6 kits, we get completely different results. Um, so there's a great need to standardize IL-6 testing. Um, and maybe that's not the, the best um, biomarker. I'm maybe slightly more partial to also looking at platelet activation markers, um, also looking at anti-inflammatory markers. Um, I'm a bit skeptical that a single marker is going to give us um, the answer that we need. But at least having a standardized IL-6 testing will be a step in the right direction. Yes, I, I, I agree with you, because at least with all the uh, uh, cytokines, the interleukin-6 seems to be elevated in most of the studies that have been uh, conducted with regards to the COVID-19 cytokine storm, as compared to other cytokines such as, and chemokines such as TNF-alpha and interleukin-8, where you've got some discrepancies. But I also saw that uh, people are also using corticosteroids for treatment, but the problem was... Um, with those corticosteroids, it's sort of like it treats a blanket of cytokines. And so far, we've only seen about one study that has identified several cytokines and chemokines that are actually elevated during a cytokine storm. Whereas the cytokine storm at the moment, it's only been limited to very few number of cytokines. So what's your take on uh, the treatment using uh, corticosteroids? Well, let me firstly say about IL-6. Um, so IL-6 is also an anti-inflammatory cytokine. It has pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory effects. Um, so the concern is, you know, maybe it's there for a reason. Maybe it is not the best idea to block IL-6 because it is trying to counteract the significant inflammation. And a lot of people are saying we should rather be looking at TNF-alpha um, because that is linked with organ damage, whereas IL-6 has not been linked with organ damage. Um, so it's quite controversial. I know most of the studies are looking at IL-6 receptor antagonists, but I don't know that, that we're going in the right direction. Regarding cortisone, that is just like a cannon that's trying to destroy a fly. You know, we are severely suppressing the entire immune system with, with cortisone. We are elevating um, glucose levels, and that has become a major problem with the COVID patients, very unstable glucose levels. And also, these patients have a very high risk of secondary bacterial infection, um, even with art steroids. So we may be aggravating all of those factors. Um, we have that one study. We also have multiple studies showing no benefit in other viral diseases. Um, influenza, SARS-1, MERS, Steroids were actually contraindicated um, and they caused more harm than good. So I think we should be careful. Um, you know, we do have the solidarity trial that is a little bit reassuring, but I don't think um, such blanket targeting of the immune system is warranted in COVID. I think so too. Um, thank you, Prof. We have another question. Are immunomodulating drugs available to target the specific markers you have highlighted? Yes, for sure. So we have lots of, of drugs from rheumatology, um, IL-1 inhibitors, IL-6 inhibitors, TNF-alpha inhibitors. Um, interestingly enough, inter, um, TNF-alpha inhibitors have not been tested in COVID. Um, and there was a recent editorial where people asked, you know, why not? Is this not, um, you know, does it not m make more sense to go for TNF-alpha rather than IL-6? But the last time I checked, there were, you know, more than 200 studies that are ongoing at the moment with specific cytokine um, blockers. So, you know, we will be getting a lot of data. The problem is just, we don't know what the levels of cytokines were in these patients before they were admitted to hospital. Um, so there's no base where we, you know, even base where we start from. Also patients are admitted at different time points in the disease. Um, so day one for one patient will not be day one for another patient. Um, and it makes it quite complicated to know how we are going to be able to compare studies with one another um, because we don't have standardized testing. Mm 
tricky. Hopefully we get it there. Thank you so much, Prof. Russell. There's more questions. Prof. Russell will answer them live in the question and answer panel. Please ask your questions there. Okay. Okay. And now we're going to move on to the last speaker for the day, Dr. Asma Salo. She's a pediatrician intensivist at the Chris Hani Paragwanath Academic Hospital. And she is... Um, she obtained her doctoral degree at the University of Vedvatazrand, and she also completed a fellowship in pediatrics and also a, a certificate in pediatric critical care uh, from the Colleges of Medicine of South Africa. Uh, she, she is currently involved in research that is working with um, Miss C in children. And she is also, in, in addition to, uh, to her clinical work, she's also interested and keen in medical education and she is a pediatrics uh, advanced uh, course instructor who runs the uh, pediatric clinical care ICU course and she also has a keen interest in uh, humanitarian aid and has been part of a number of national and international uh, missionary aids that have been hosted by the Gift for Givers, which is an, a local NGO. And she also has also completed another fellowship in Canada, Toronto, at the Hospital for Sick Children. So I will hand over to Dr. Asma Salo. Um, I just want to check, can you hear my, uh, can you see my slides? Yes. Thank you very much, Kanye Sire, for that introduction. So I'm good. thank you very much to Sanjay and for the organizers as well for the invitation to speak today and good afternoon, everybody. My talk will shift focus slightly from the immunolog immunological aspects that Teresa and Sanjay have covered to more to the clinical aspects of um, COVID-19 disease and specifically MISC in children. Um, my talk is going to look at what we already know about SARS-CoV-2 infection in children. Then I'm going to do a brief overview of some of the patients we've taken care of at Chris Hani Bayakwanath Hospital. And then the majority of the talk will focus on MISC in children and just a quick whirlwind tour um, through MISC. So if we start off with what we know about SARS-CoV-2 and children, we know that children and adolescents have lower susceptibility um, for infection and a meta-analysis done by Viner et al. that comprised of about 42,000 kids and 270,000 adults um, came to this conclusion. Also from reports coming out of China from the Chinese CDC have shown that less than 1% of infections occur in children less than 10 years of age. Also, we know that most infected children appear to have a milder course of disease and that asymptomatic infections are quite common. Um, in a study that looked at about 46 pediatric intensive care units across North America, they found that severe illness in children is significant, but far less frequent than in adults, and that pre-hospital comorbidities also appear to be an important factor in children for COVID-19 disease. And the most common symptoms that children present with are fever, dry cough, pharyngeal erythema, and fatigue, but these symptoms are still less frequent than those found in the adult population. If we look at our experience at Chris Heine Baragwanath Hospital, um, up till the 10th of October, we had approximately 130 children between zero to 14 years of age who were admitted to the pediatric wards with um, a positive PCR. Um, the majority of these kids presented with very atypical presentations. Only about 20 to 30% presented with the typical adult presentations with the respiratory tract signs. Um, 12 of these children required ICU admission, and we'll go through those very briefly. Um, two of them were children with MISC. Two were children that came to the ICU because of large percentage body surface area of burns. Four of the patients who were admitted with COVID pneumonia of that, one was a neonate. Um, another one was a child with tetralogy of fallow and congenital heart disease. Um, another one was an asthmatic, and the fourth one was a 14-year-old who had chronic lung disease we had one child admitted with DKA who subsequently developed ARDS and was part of the children that demise. And then we had three patients with incidental COVID. The one was a child with neonatal sepsis um, and two of the others were children who had presented for elective surgery. The one was a child with a cerebral abscess and another one with a maxillary tumor. 
Out of the ICU patients, we had five deaths. And like I mentioned, one of the patients, the patient was DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis demise. One of the burns patients demise, and that patient had toxic shock syndrome. Two of the patients with um, COVID pneumonia, the neonate and the child with tetralogy of fallow also demised, and the child with neonatal sepsis also demised. If we look at multi-inflammatory syndrome, in the early stages of the COVID-19 pandemic, and especially in the reports coming out of Wuhan, children seem to be relatively spared from serious effects of the COVID-19 disease. Um, around mid-April, the retrieval service, the retrieval service in the United Kingdom noticed that they were transferring an increasing number of children with hyperinflammatory shock to the referral centers. Um, and this prompted this um, statement that was released at the end of April by the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health in London. And around the same time, this case reports coming out of Italy that showed an increased incidence of Kawasaki's disease. And what was atypical about the um, presentation were most of these kids were not in the typical um, Kawasaki age range, which is an in infancy, whereas these kids were bigger. Um, this then prompted on the 1st of May a report, um, release of a report by the CDC, which was then followed by the WHO, both of whom came up with their own case definitions. If we look at the next slide, um, and this is a table comparing the three definitions, they're very similar, but they do have some subtle differences in terms of some of the characteristics. So um, the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health called the syndrome PIMS-TS, which is Pediatric Inflammatory Multisystem Syndrome, temporarily associated with SARS-CoV-2, whereas the WHO and CDC stuck with the name Multisystem Inflammatory Syndrome of Children. Um, the ages differ in that the, Royal College definition has an unspecified age and WHO has up to 19 years and CDC less than 21. Then the signs of inflammation and in terms of the characteristics of the fever, the numbers of organs involved also differ between the three definitions and then other subtle features. The WHO seem to keep all of the Kawasaki type features in whereas the other two just categorize them into different organ system features. And then one thing common between all of the definitions is exclusions of other causes and um, excluding other plausible diagnoses for the clinical presentation. And the other difference is in terms of SARS-CoV-2 testing, the Royal College definition doesn't require confirmatory tests for SARS-CoV-2, whereas the WHO and CDC definitions require either PCR antigen or antibody test. Um, and in the absence of those, some kind of history of contact with a COVID-19 patient. In South Africa, the NICD has chosen to go with the WHO definition. And since the 9th of September, MISC is a notifiable medical condition um, in South Africa. So any of the clinicians who do come across patients with um, MISC um, to be aware of that and to please notify those kids. So how do we know that this hyperinflammatory syndrome is actually related to SARS-CoV-2? If you look at this graph, which comes out of Dufort's paper, um, which is one of the central papers that have come out describing the children with MISC, and very similar graphs appear in the other sentinel papers by Falstein and Whitaker. Um, and what this shows is it looks at the number of pediatric COVID-19 cases, which is represented here in blue, and then it looks at a time frame, and then the MISC cases that are outlined here in red, with this black graph being the average number of cases per week. And what you can see, and it's very similar to what Sanjay said in his talk talking about the immunology, is that approximately three to six weeks after the peak of COVID-19 infections, that's when you see the MISC cases. And this trend has been noticed in South Africa as well by the Cape Town group, and we've seen a similar trend at Barra as well. In terms of the pathogenesis of the disease, um, if we look at the pathogenesis, this explanation of the association with SARS-CoV-2 fits with this delayed hyperinflammatory phase, and both Teresa and Sanjay have talked about the immunology details. So all I'm gonna say is that as a result of this very dysregulated immune response, these children develop a cytokine storm that manifests as hyperinflammatory shock with different clinical manifestations. 
we then look at those different clinical manifestations, what we've seen is that unlike in um, typical COVID-19 disease, there isn't a male predominance and males and females seem to be equally affected um, with MISC. The age range is between six to 12 years of age and there seems to be a preponderance in black, Asian and Afro-Caribbean children. There are many different clinical manifestations and MISC mimics a variety of already known conditions like Kawasaki's disease, toxic shock syndrome, or macrophage activation syndrome. Um, from the literature reports, and there've been five to six sentinel papers that were the initial reports of this um, disease coming out of the UK, the US, Italy, and then one from Pakistan. In those papers, 100% of children presented with fever at admission or sometime um, in, their medic in, in their admission course, um, also, up to 80% of children had mucocutaneous manifestations, of which conjunctivitis was the most common, but other manifestations as listed on the graphic there, like skin peeling, erythema, um, generalized rashes, and very non-specific looking rashes can be part of the presentation. Also, up to 90% of children presented with GI symptoms, um, which I think when we started and were looking out for COVID-19 patients, we didn't think about GIT symptoms because everybody was looking for the upper respiratory or respiratory tract um, symptoms, but 90% of the kids with MISC present with GIT symptoms with very non-specific symptoms like nausea, vomiting, um, abdominal pain, and diarrhea. And some kids even to the extent that they require a laparotomy for appendix. Of the ICU patients, we've had two patients actually presented with what looked like appendicitis and had um, laparotomy for an appendix, which was actually normal. Um, and this is the trend in international um, findings as well. In terms of cardiac manifestations, 62 to 87% of patients have presented with shock requiring inotropes. Um, in the international cohort, about 2% of these patients needed ECMO. Um, and there's a variety of cardiac abnormalities from myocarditis, um, left ventricular dysfunction to different ranges of coronary artery abnormalities starting from just echo bright coronary arteries to dilated and aneurysmal um, coronary arteries and they also these kids are presented presenting with raised troponin t and pro bnp as well um, in terms of neuro manifestations, about 30% of children will present with um, neurological signs. And once again, it's a wide range of presenting symptoms from lethargy, headache, confusion to seizures. Um, and there's been a number of case reports showing kids who presented with neuropsychiatric symptoms, um, status epilepticus and paralysis-like um, syndromes. And interestingly, one of the first patients we admitted to ICU at Barra with Ms. C was actually a patient referred as a meningococcal sepsis because she had this fever and rash. Um, and one of the other patients was admitted as query a Gillian Barre syndrome. So there's a wide variety of manifestation of symptoms. Um, a very small number of um, children present with acute kidney injury and renal failure. Only two out of the 20 patients that presented with MIS-C um, required um, renal replacement therapy. And respiratory signs and symptoms are very unusual, and very few patients actually need ventilation. And most of the patients that have been ventilated have actually been ventilated secondary to presenting in shock rather than from um, primary respiratory abnormalities. Um, in terms of laboratory and hematological features, thrombocytopenia, neutrophilia, and lymphopenia are common, like in the other COVID-19 patients. And obviously, in terms of inflammatory markers, we have high SR, CRP, um, high ferritin levels, high D-dimers, and low fibrinogens, even in the absence of clots. We look very briefly at management of um, MISC. Um, in the Northern Hemisphere cohorts, most of the children were managed in pediatric ICUs, um, up to 80% of these children. The management is mainly supportive and with immunomodulatory agents. The treatment is extrapolated from the known diseases like Kawasaki's disease, macrophage activation syndrome. Um, most kids in the literature, up to 80%, have re received intravenous immunoglobulin. Um, as well as steroids in a slightly smaller amount. And those patients that haven't responded to IVIG and steroids have received immunomodulatory agents like IL-1 or IL-6 inhibitors. Um, because of the deranged coagulation parameters, a lot of kids have received thromboprophylaxis, and this is 
there's not much in the literature actually directing our uh, management in terms of whether we should be doing prophylaxis or doing therapeutic anticoagulation. Just from our experience at Barra, two of the kids, um, despite being on thromboprophylaxis, subsequently developed clots. Um, so it's an area of that there's a gap in the research there. And then antiplatelet agents for those children that have um, coronary artery abnormalities. And once again, this comes from the Kawasaki's literature. Um, and there are some trials that are looking at treatment options in children. And obviously it's not easy to do a randomized control trial, but there's different trial designs that are happening at the moment. If we look at the outcomes of MISC, the outcomes are actually quite good. The mortality is only two to 3% in developed countries, whereas it was 13% in the Pakistani cohort that was described, but the big difference there might also be related to resources and ICU care, because only a quarter of the patients in that cohort received ICU care, whereas in the other cohorts, up to 80% um, were in an ICU um, environment. 36% of patients develop coronary artery abnormalities, and what's interesting is that the development of coronary artery abnormalities can be delayed, and sometimes initial echoes are normal, but patients are found to have um, progression of um, abnormalities of the coronary arteries on repeat and subsequent echoes. Um, as was mentioned earlier by Kanisile, we don't know the long-term sequelae, um, and obviously we'll have to wait um, for data from uh, other countries. And also we've applied for ethics clearance for a study at Barra to look at our MISC patients and to hopefully follow them up and to see what their long-term um, effects are. Just before I end, I'll look very briefly at our experience with MISC at Barra. So to date, we've admitted 20 children to the hospital. Um, luckily, to, up to now, we haven't had any deaths that I know about. Four of these children um, were actually COVID PCR positive at admission. And from the results that we've managed to get, 12 of them had IgG antibodies present. Six of the children were admitted to ICU, and the reason they were admitted was for monitoring as well as organ support, some needed ventilation, renal replacement therapy, and inotropes. So just to summarize, we know that um, in children with SARS-CoV-2 infection, they have actually children have a lower susceptibility to infection, they have a milder course and better outcomes. At Barra, we've seen similar experiences to the rest of the world and that children differ in their presentations compared to adults. MISC is becoming an emerging problem in children. It mimics many other conditions. And I think we're learning each day as we see more and more of these kids. And one of the messages is to high, have a high index of suspicion when you see children with these very nonspecific symptoms and that we need more research to be able to understand um, and manage this disease better. Thank you very much, and I can take any questions. Thank you so much, Asma. Uh, we have a question, and the question reads as follows. Um, thanks for the talk, Asma. Would you say there is a higher or lower incidence of MIS-C in South Africa as compared to other parts of the world? And if so, what do you think is, the contri is contributing to these differences? That's a question from Tandega. Um, I think it's very difficult to say. I don't know that we have more or less than the rest of the world. If you look at the papers that have been published and described, so they've described probably a prevalence of like 96, I can't remember the numbers offhand now, but one of the papers had probably about 96 patients in just New York State and another one at 181 or 130 something. The numbers um, evade me now, but we don't know that as compared to what our numbers are in South Africa to the number of patients we've had with COVID-19 infection. So yeah, I don't think I can give a very um, confident answer about whether we're seeing more or less than other countries or other places. All right, thank you. And then I just wanted to ask, uh, with the study that was conducted in the Western Cape in South Africa, they said that uh, there, there was an overrepresentation of actually black children who had MIS-C. Could you, uh, do you have any suggestion why that is the case? So if we look at the children that we've seen at Barra as well, and that might just be the number of the, the demographics of the kids that we see at our centers um, in the public sector, but in the private sector, just talking to colleagues there, they have seen patients of Asian or um, other racial profiles. So I think it might just be that the 
demographics of the children that are presenting to the um, state health sector versus private health sector. And that might be the reason why. Having said that also, but um, in the Northern Hemisphere countries, there has a, been a predominance of children of Black and Asian race. Um, and I think that might be a similar thing. And there is a genetic study that's also being done to see if there are genetic differences to um, patients mounting this immune response and therefore developing MISC. All right. Thank you so much, Asma, for the great talk. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. Uh, but before we go, I um, would like to make a few announcements. This brings to an end for our COVID-19 um, webinars, but we still have uh, other webinars that are to follow in the future. So if you're not yet a member of the South African Immunology Society, I think this will be a good time for you to join. And also uh, to sh also share the exciting news uh, uh, the International Congress of Immunology is coming to South Africa in August 2022. Hopefully by then we would have a vaccine for COVID-19 and we would be kind of like sort of like back to our normal lives. Uh, but it's a build up. It'll be the first time that it's going to be hosted in South Africa and we would love to welcome all immunologists from around the world uh, and host them on our home soil, Mother Africa. So now I'm going to hand over to Teresa, who has been an organizer of these COVID webinars. And I'd like to thank all our speakers for the wonderful talks that I gave. She has a few announcements that she would like to make. Over to you, Teresa. Thank you, Kanisile. Let me just quickly share my screen again. Great. So I would just like to take this opportunity to thank a few people. Um, firstly, the attendees, you know, our idea with this webinar series was to create a platform where busy clinicians, scientists, and researchers could catch up with the immunology of COVID um, because it is changing so quickly and we wanted to provide an up-to-date and accurate information platform. And I really hope that we've succeeded in doing that. Then I would like to thank Clive Gray and the Immunopedia team for allowing us to use the Immunopedia platform. A special thanks to Bon, Kanyasile, and Chaleka for all the behind the scenes work. Also, thank you to Louise um, for designing the adverts, to Melinda and Hina from SICE, and Annie and Bridget from Unscreen for all your assistance. Um, you were really all great, and it was wonderful to work with you. For all the attendees, please remember that the recordings are available on the SICE website. Um, we've also applied for CPD points for the webinar series. Um, so people who require CPD points, please contact any class at the following address or visit the SICE website for more information. So thank you very much and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. It's been lovely having you. And thank you, Teresa. And thank you, Ingraba Biotech, for sponsoring our COVID-19 webinars. And to all our attendees, thank you for supporting us. And we look forward to also having you in the future for our future webinars. And to all the amazing speakers today, thank you so much. May everyone have a lovely day.